Yo, what's up, Sam? Yo, what's happening? I'm good, man. Glad to be in LA, man. Yeah, Glad to too. knock these podcasts out. For sure. Being able to record from such an incredible space this week. Yeah, man. Out of the EQT, EQT office. And stu- recording studios. And we interviewed the co-founder of EQT, a mentor of mine, Henny Yagazu. Henny started his career as a promoter in D.C., put on some really big shows, put on one of the first shows he put on was a Mac Miller show, just to show you the scale of, you know, where he started and where he is today. Went from the live sector into management. One of his first clients was Goldlink. Started in a small office in D.C. and ended up in this office that we're, in, that we're here, you know, recording in today. In downtown LA. Um, I've been able to see him grow over the past, you know, four or five years almost and seeing him grow from a small business owner to something really significant, having a a JV, you know, with, with universal and having Dan see his partner, Dan grow with him. I, you know, I think it's all been a magical experience. So, you know, I'm honored to have him on this, on this episode. And I'm really glad we got into the things we did because a lot of it isn't just history about Henny, but it's also history about EQT. It's about the history of 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 of, of me and, and and how I ended up developing into you know being a part of this podcast. Even you know for so. sure, for sure. And I mean, I think they've been able to manage and work with such incredible artists. Uh, I mean, and really have a unique and, and special sound, very progressive sound. I mean, from Metro Boomin and Goldlink to Smino and Masego and and Berhana and JPEG Mafia. I think it's a very progressive sound and. Uh, also really just love too. I feel like there's a lot of managers that get caught in becoming just the, the solo operation, the one man team, the one man band, which I think is cool. And obviously there's no right or wrong way. I mean, do what makes you the happiest, but what I do really respect Henny for doing a lot is how he's really been able to scale the operation, build out EQT higher and work with an incredible team with the, uh, aside from Jordan, (laughs) no, I'm kidding. Jordan's the MVP on that team. Um, (laughs) so I think it's, uh, Really cool to see that journey of scaling and how Henny's career has evolved throughout the years. So without any further ado, I'm really excited for this episode. Grateful to be recording out of the EQT studios. Um, and without any further ado, Henny. Let's do it. What's up, Henny? How you doing, man? What's up, what's up, man? Glad to finally have you on the podcast, man. Yeah, it's about time. Yeah. It's... uh. I've been watching you guys grow for the past year. I want to put that out there, too, that it was. it's just been great seeing it grow Really proud of what you guys are doing with Thanks, it. Thanks, man. So, Appreciate I'm that. Excited man. to be on it. It's gotten to some corners of the web that I don't think we expected. And, the you dark know. net, bro. <laughs> <laughs> a music industry nerds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess let's get into it, man. So, I mean, you know, obviously, I know a lot of your history, but for the people yeah. that don't, like, what were you? What were you doing before you were in management? Yeah. Um, before I was in management, I actually started in this business um, on the live side. You know, um, I was in college was sort of, uh, I mean, we'd take it back even further than that, throwing parties and kind of being in like sort of like the club scene in D.C. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then that, but always had a deep passion for music, you know, messed around with making music when I was in high school and college too. Um, so when I got the opportunity to start booking artists through um, friends of mine in the D.C. area that, uh, if you want to take it all the way back to like the mixtape era, they were pretty big in the mixtape scene out there. This is probably like 08, 09. Um, so they had some connections to to artists that were coming in town. And some of like the earliest stuff I remember was like Little Scrappy and Project Pat and like T-Pain and stuff, and stuff in that era. And the first show that I was actually able to book myself with my own money and found my own venue and put it on was actually Mac Miller. Um, and uh, that was the first time that I started. That was kind of my kickoff point of realizing like, oh, I could actually do music as, as a career. Yeah. How long were you doing that? That was like 2009 to like, maybe actually more like 2010 to 2013, 14. Yeah. So what brought you to management from that? Like what what were this, you know, I always tell people, I, you know, before I joined EQT, I was at a, yeah. a PR agency and I didn't felt like, I didn't feel like it went far enough. Mm-hmm. Like I was helping develop the story, but there was a ceiling there that I wanted to like break through and actually get to know the artist. What yeah. What went from you being from, you know, in the being in the live scene to being like, I want to help with everything? Yeah, I mean, I, I think coming from being a creative person, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, messing around with music, sort of being um, really in a discovery. You know, I would I would find acts early. I mean, I think we all remember that era, the blog, YouTube yeah. era, where you stumble across a kid with a dope video and it's like, oh, who's Kid Cudi? Mm-hmm. Who's, right. you know, <laughs> <clears throat> who's this guy, Big Sean? Who's Mike Posner? And I was right. like, I just got really sucked into like that world. And, and I was identifying stuff that I could see that my peers liked. And I was excited to like share that with people, you yeah. know? 
Um, and I guess the lowest point of entry or the easiest point of entry at the time for whatever reason was throwing shows. But I think I always knew that I wanted to get even closer than that and be in the process. And, you know, it was really dope that era. I mean, it was, man, I mean, Currency and Wiz, How Fly. Me and my boys threw a show in Richmond where they did How Fly front to back. Mm. You know, and I, I'm not going to say exactly the price, but I think we got them for like a couple grand or Damn. something. Wiz and, and Currency. Rent together. Yeah, with flights, hotels, and a couple grand. That's right? crazy. So that era and and seeing guys like Will Zombach, who still manages Wiz to this day, um, having the same exact 412 number since then, right? So um, meeting some of those guys back then when they're on the road with their acts, you know, uh, whether it was... I was like the hops and funk volume era or like, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that was considered like underground kind of backpack hip hop mm-hmm. was being overlooked by a lot of the bigger venues, whether that's like the 930 Club. The Fillmore wasn't even around at this mm-hmm. time yet mm-hmm. in D.C. I think it might have just opened towards the end of me being a promoter. Um, so there was a little bit of a, a void for um, for that type of hip hop. Right. Like there wasn't buyers in the market looking to book that kind of stuff. It right. wasn't it was st- it was still and, and it was the EDM era. Right. So. It was the era where everyone was sort of like, oh, that's where all the tickets are. Mm-hmm. So I, I was, it was actually almost kind of like easier than I thought to not really have a background in it or a strong mentor in it, mm-hmm. but was able to like put together some deals, whether it was like two, three grand with a back end split on the door or something like that, just enough to like get them to agree. And a lot of times these guys were routing their first tours and they needed a, a 400, 500 cap room on the way to the South, right? Right. Um, so and I mean, you guys, all you guys interviewed my boy Harrison, who manages Logic. That's a, that was a great story because he is from the DMV, obviously. Mm-hmm. So he uh, was actually originally was starting to maybe sort of start a management situation with the person that was that owned the venue that I that I threw shows in. Mm-hmm. So he's like, "You heard of this kid Logic? Um, we're gonna throw a show for him. I just picked him up for management, so that's kind of like his first thing yeah, for, yeah. for picking him up. I'm, I'm gonna put you in my venue. We're gonna do a show." And I remember this is probably the summer of 2011. And a few kids showed up the day before for, I think we had Fat Trail or someone the day before. And a few kids showed up. It's a Logic show today. It was like 10 kids outside. I remember being like, oh, wow. Like he has kids. Like that, that, this, He's so <laughs> small at this point. I'm like, really? You want to throw a headline show for him? Yeah, like, yeah. it's your venue. That's cool. Well, let's right, do it, right? right, right, right. Um, you wanted me to like help with it, you know, because I was, I was an outside promoter, but I was friends with the owner, of course. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and a couple kids came early thinking it was the wrong day. It's like, oh, he really has fans. And the next day, I think 50 kids came, 40 mm-hmm. or 50 kids. Literally almost to the day, a year later, he did his first headline tour, sold it out in advance. Room was, I mean, through the roof. The energy was through the roof. That's when he went on that, like, that run with those videos that were really mm-hmm, starting to connect. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually where he met DJ Rhetoric, too, his DJ, because mm-hmm. he used to like sleep on my floor before he would play shows for me. <laughs> he was like my house That's DJ. Crazy. Yeah. That's so he crazy. he would open up for he would like be the DJ in between the acts to keep That's like crazy. the energy flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um and he went on in between Taya Bali and Logic and he went he went so hard and he killed the room and Logic was watching it from a, a, above and he was just like, oh, I need a DJ. Cause before yeah. that, Six was just on iTunes, his mm-hmm. producer pressing play. Uh, so that was like a great story in a yeah, moment, yeah, like to awesome. see him go from 40 tickets to sold out a year later. And then from there it was like right. gone. Right. And I think those moments, I think were some of the moments that really inspired me to go like, man, I got to find my own artist. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like I got to be a part of that process too, right. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, you know, throwing shows, paid the bills. I opened up a recording studio that also acted as my office. It was, you know, a lot smaller than the space we're in yeah, now. Geez. It was like kind of like a uh, like in a little like dentist area in Falls Church, Virginia. I think I was paying like twelve hundred bucks for rent, but I could use two rooms in the front, little lobby, and then the back room. We flipped to like maybe like a hundred square foot room. We flipped mm. to like a just a real simple studio. Yeah, um, and that was cool too because then I got closer to the creation process. Yeah, by and it, it became this thing where. Um, if you're a local artist in the area and you want to open up on these these shows at Empire and the Howard Theater and Baltimore Soundstage, I was kind of running stuff all the way down to Virginia Beach doing right. those venues. Yeah, you, if you get in with Nice CNT and Henny and those guys, like you can open up on the shows. Mm-hmm. So like, I just had this like contact list of all these local rappers that right. were emailing me to get on shows. Like, what do I do with this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I got some equipment from when I used to try to like you know mess around making music. I bought another mic, like Jordan. 
Yeah, <laughs> he he keep trying to bring it up. I know, podcast, yeah. Some people looking up. <laughs> hey man, we've all we've all spent some bars at some point in our lives. <laughs> Dan, uh, uh, Sam too. Is it true? Yeah, 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 he hey, scraped man. it. Oh, he scraped it clean out the end. Yeah, but I heard no, it. No, it's pri- private SoundCloud. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, the it's not wrong. Man. It's part of the journey. Yeah. Um, and um. Yeah, so I just heard this thing where I just was, you know, starting to do showcases at the same venue that were really cool, actually. Man, funny, guys like like IDK were some of the earliest acts on my yeah. showcases. And this is, like, early days. Like, he has to, like, kind of sell tickets to be on the showcase mm-hmm. and bring people out and stuff like that. Um, they, you know that group, They? Of course. Yeah, yeah one, I think Dante is his name. Yeah, and They, he's from the DMV. He was on the showcase back in the day. So, you know, it was crazy. Um, I just created this culture, and I didn't realize what I was creating where it was, you know, Northern Virginia, an area that isn't necessarily a big market, but they, but, it, but we had a really good venue for what for that cap mm-hmm. size, and it was right outside of DC, and it just became like the place to go to for that right. type of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was my first, I think, you know, I didn't again, I didn't really know what was happening in real time, but mm-hmm. looking back on it, it was like my first example of like creating an ecosystem or right. creating like a world. And I mean, we had Little B come through that venue, MGK, Big Sean, early on. Uh, you know, um, man, what like a uh, big crit currency of oh, that whole era, like was I was just, I was just a part of it mm-hmm. yeah. as a promoter. But I was just seeing the energy in the rooms and right. like, you know, who would come in and out the rooms. Right. Like what type of kids, how they dressed, how they acted, like how fast tickets would sell out. And I think that whole time I was just learning. You know what I'm saying? I was mm-hmm. just soaking it all in. And it, it became more innate for me to realize or for me to pick up on when an act had something special that people were going to actually care about. Right. Or, you know, there's the act that like sort of has a moment around a, a record. And then there's an act that's like really creating like a lifestyle and a world for their fans to live in. Mm-hmm. And um, all that whole process prepared me for, you know, what I have going on now. So, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And then uh, you mentioned an act created a world for their artists to live in or for their fans to live in. Uh, that came up in a, a different episode recently too. So I'd love to hear your perspective from the management side, how you think about artists creating this this world or this reason for their fans to really want to connect and develop a really strong relationship with the artists. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I think it takes a special kind of artist for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, we've seen a lot of people do it. Um, and it's in every aspect of what they're doing whether they sort of are intentionally doing it or not you know what Mm -hmm. i mean like what you're talking about how you're talking about it where you're from you know what i mean the Mm -hmm. the regional tones and nuances and 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 where that connection comes from people that can relate to like oh i've been to st louis or i've been to new york Mm -hmm. or i've been to you know um then then it goes down into the art and the aesthetic and the storytelling um and when you nail it it's like anything else like the more that i do this i'm starting to just see all the you know, similarities between film and TV and art and music and mm-hmm. you're creating something unique for people to live in. And right. if you if you do it well enough, like it's not, it could stand the test of time, right? Like totally. that's kind of like the end goal for an artist like that right. is to create something that's going to really truly be timeless and almost like you almost can't duplicate it because it's mm-hmm. just so unique to them. Yeah. There's only a few artists that really pull it off all for the sure. way, right? Totally. And, and you can get, you can pick up on the intent when an artist is sometimes like, you know, it's okay to be inspired and be a fan of other artists, but there's those special artists that you can tell it's really coming from somewhere else. You know what yeah. I mean? You know, they, yeah, they really know how to make themselves it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. when that happens, that's when like, I feel like the the special sauce, that's the special sauce. You know, right. That's the magic. And totally. then when you're able to identify those type of artists, mm-hmm. that's when you're able to go put all the resources around it and scale them. You can't go create that, right? right. Like, I think in a, in a, in a, a traditional record label sense and in a in a idea to sell records you're you're trying to make records and you're trying to almost manufacture hits with artists right. and that's one way of doing it and it works and there's nothing wrong with that yeah. but it's getting harder and harder to pull that off with how what sells across the board now has to be authentic because everything's so exposed you yeah. know so i think there's even a bigger space for artists that can create their own worlds and and do their own thing. And right. we talk a lot about there's like a, a new middle class in the music industry, yeah. right? Because of streaming and mm-hmm. just so many avenues to build businesses around your music. Totally. So you now you can sort of sustain this idea that you're building because you didn't have to go, like you, you, you weren't going to inflate because you couldn't get that check from the major label. There's right. a way to sort of run that business the right way. For sure. Um, and that's like a sweet spot that I think a lot of people don't really know how to do, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and that's something that that is that that I kind of like 
pride our team in and, and what mm-hmm. we kind of focus on doing with a lot of our artists. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So when it comes to actually building EQT into a management company and now there's the even kind of label component, how well, did you... I want to ask one yeah, question please. before that actually kind of back into the earlier days, which is like for, I think there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast that have just started managing. So I'm wondering what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned in that period where you were like, I'm really going to dive into this and, and, and do this full time and, and manage clients. Like, so what, what in the beginning are some things they should be paying attention to as, as, as managers kind of just starting out on their journey? Yeah. I mean, definitely a, a big question. Um, I think it's different for everyone else, um, mm. for, for everybody else. Um, it's very unique to each person. Um, for me, having the live experience was a big help, right? Mm. Like, I know sometimes someone, there's always different avenues, right? Like, someone's interning at a label and they find a dope back and then they end up, like, quitting the label and working on that act if mm. it takes off or, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of different, but you have to have some kind of experience, you know what I mean, to yeah. learn, to understand what it is. And if you don't, be super aware that you don't and be a sponge and yeah. listen and you got to find a couple you know mentors whether that's like a mm-hmm. lawyer that's showing you the ropes like for me for example i didn't necessarily know the legal side like how would i know <laughs> that right like um yeah there's still always going to be room for a lawyer you're never going to really know every detail the landscape changes a bit <clears throat> but to really understand what you're signing your artists up for you know mm-hmm. um to really understand value and to know where that value is going to come from whether that's in digital and creative, um, in touring, um, and what the the world the artist needs to live in to really excel. <clears throat> I think now there's a there's a very uh, low point of entry for management because you can find your friend could be that dope artist. There's a low point of entry to create music. Yeah, exactly right. So, so it goes hand in hand. So you know, there's your friends a dope artist, and you know they they put some stuff on on the, on YouTube and SoundCloud and Spotify. Starts to move, and R start reaching out. You're you're organizing on points. You're like, man, let me manage you. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that happens. We see that a lot, yeah. and I'm not knocking that because that is how a lot of people get their start, and that's mm-hmm. really dope if you could if you could figure it out. Um, but if you're in that seat, if you're in that seat. Be a sponge. Be aware. You know, don't put the, you know, whatever, the cart before the horse. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. pay attention. Um, know what you're signing yourself up to because, and be ready to, to possibly partner if it makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. be open to to what's going to help get that artist to the next level, you know? Right. And then how did you go about taking on to, and learning those lessons and deploying some of those lessons into scaling yourself, building out a team, building out EQT. Uh, it's not just managing one artist. You have a like a, a dope roster of super progressive artists. Yeah, <clears throat> man. I mean, it's you know, I, 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 you know, I thank my parents for kind of instilling like a entrepreneurial background mm-hmm. in me. You know, whether they were like whether they thought I was listening or not, I guess I was. <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. So like, I think that helped a bit. Um, being open minded, you know, being open to partner with people, understanding mm-hmm. like where the give and the take is and, you know, believe, right. believing in like young people that are super smart, like Jordan mm-hmm. <laughs> kills it. Uh, you know, that, that was a big, that was a, a big turning point. And I think recognizing when you're in a moment and mm-hmm. like you, you know, our, our roster, you can see the, the lineage between it. And it's like, I think we, we identified that we were in a moment where we were seeing the next sort of version of where, where art and where artists were progressing and going to. Right. And we were like, just taking risks and like yeah. doubling down on stuff. And For you know sure. what I mean? Like, um, having some of our first two clients become pretty successful definitely helps, mm-hmm. but we could have also been like kind of stuck in that box mm-hmm. and not realize what the bigger vision was, you know what totally, I mean? Totally. Um, and thank God that we did. And I think it's really helped create a sustainable environment for all mm-hmm. the artists, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's now there's a place where, those sort of left the center artists can go and say like, oh, okay, like they get what I'm trying to do. Right. You know, this is a good place for me to like live and scale. For sure. Um, and it becomes bigger than you. You know, yeah, it's bigger totally. than me. It's bigger than my partner, Dan. It's bigger than Jordan. It's kind of bigger than all of us. You right. Know? right. 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 When it comes to like signing artists and actually growing your roster, um, I mean, it's nice that you've been able to, like you said, you've curated a sound. So people, you have a lot of respect in this kind of, this cool niche. Um, when it comes to, I mean, there's a lot of people, young managers that might see an artist that they really believe in, that they want to work with them. I'm curious how your pitch to artists has evolved throughout the years as far as what sort of value EQT can create for artists and how you go about communicating that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, definitely making sure we're just intentional about, you know, what artists we work with and pick up. You know what I mean? I think um, 
that's that's definitely grown. And um, yeah, I mean, I, and I, I, in the beginning, I could say that sometimes it could feel like a pitch in some early meetings, you know what right. I mean? But now it's like, I don't think it's that. I think it's more so like, you know, it's, it's going to take a few meetings. It's not mm-hmm. going to happen in one. Right. Um, it's got to really make sense. I got to feel mm-hmm. like between now our team of nine or so, yeah. yeah, about nine or so, that we can build a team around you. You mm-hmm. know, we're putting somewhat around about three people around each artist, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, from day to day, senior person, and then someone on the marketing side if mm-hmm. it's a label, um, or if it's a management client that we partner with another manager, you know, mm-hmm. like we have some great partners, like, you know, my partner Chris Classic on on Smino, you know, he has his own company, Classic, Classic mm-hmm. Studios from mm-hmm. Chicago, then a lot of amazing stuff out there, and we've been partnered on SME since day one, you know, mm-hmm. so some people yeah, yeah, might yeah. not see that, we don't really advertise how right. we do things, but right. like we've been part, we've been, you know, co-management from, from dollar one, you know, right, day right, one, right, right. so, um, he adds a ton of value, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So that might that might help me not have to apply too much bandwidth on other stuff because he's there to knock a lot of things mm-hmm, out and be sure. a part of the process. So like what's the what's the formula and the team to put around the artist to get the stuff done mm-hmm. ultimately? Mm-hmm. And then you gotta figure out what the structure is within that. Yeah. You know? Um yeah. And then for an artist that's evaluating whether or not they want to work with a management company, like from your perspective, what do you feel should be non-negotiables or things that artists should really be keeping top of mind when they're having conversations with potential managers? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, It's interesting now seeing a lot of artists get sort of to a certain place on their own. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm sure they're getting some help, but um, I actually had a meeting the other day with an artist who, you know, had management for a second. It was like a proper management company, Mm -hmm. young kid, and he kind of like stepped out and he is handling a lot of stuff on his own, like setting up his own meetings, everything. Right. But it's like, that's only going to go so far. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And like, you're ultimately paying for perspective. You mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. you need people who can see down the down the field. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. you might be able to see down the field creatively to a degree. Right. But imagine when you put just the right couple of pieces around it and some experience. You yeah, know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, you're sure. trying to really, and, and that's the thing for an artist to re- re- realize too. I think there's this era now where everything feels very accessible everyone everyone you have access to whoever you really want to get a hold of mm-hmm. like the guy the kid i was meeting with was you know he's he's reaching out to spotify editorial people on his own mm-hmm. he found he found out who does the cool playlist yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he's yeah, dming yeah. them and they like his music so that's he's like fine. oh I, I did have the job already you know? <laughs> yeah. it's just like that's not really what it's about though you know it's like cool right. you got on a few playlists but like what's the idea like what are you trying to grow here right, right. like what are like those moments when you know what like if we we could actually go sell out a 200 cap room. And there's probably artists that go, I don't know how to do that, but I know right. how to get on playlists and I'm getting fans. Yeah. So like, am I too early to do that show or should I do that? Right. And you might've missed a whole window to galvanize the first like layer of your fan yeah. base, you know? And that's yeah, a super yeah, yeah, important yeah. piece, For you know? Sure. Like understanding how delicate it is to really grow an artist, especially in, in this era where there's just too much right. <laughs> yeah. shit coming out. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like way too much shit coming out. Even Even when I think about how we grew a few of our acts in 2016 and 17. Like, mm-hmm. I got to, like, kind of rearrange my brain on, mm-hmm. like, what, I, what what you're going to do in 2020, you know right. what I mean? And what are those early moments and stuff, you know, and what matters. So mm-hmm. if 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 people who are in the industry looking across multiple clients, so they have the ability to see, like, what worked here, what worked there, right. that those where the windows are sort of opening up, what's mm-hmm. important, leveraging relationships to get stuff for your baby acts. We do that all the time, mm-hmm. right? Like, that's that's the stuff that's, like, important. That's huge. Yeah, and making sure that um, you fit in that culture, you right. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen some really dope managers that kill it in indie rock and they try and they pick up like their first rapper and they and yeah and, and it's great like no shade to nobody but like they'll hit me and be like yo world. it's a whole different world they're like yo what do you think about this what do you think about that they're kind of like picking my brain on stuff mm-hmm. and i'm happy to do it mm-hmm. but it's like it's more than like a few looks it's like yeah. you got to understand yeah, 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 the yeah, culture yeah, yeah. of the artist you know yeah, what i mean yeah. like it's so delicate like For sure. you know um and and i think that's your know, i think that's a big reason why you're seeing a lot of ventures you know pop up sort of in different places with young executives who come from being managers, but they realize like, you know, you're going to do a lot of work to f- discover an act and and put time and energy into mm-hmm. breaking them that like, and, and the majors aren't going to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> a major label is not going to get on the phone to plan the tour and line it up with the album right. and be in the studio super late and, you know, right. like make sure all these, those things happen. So labels are like, you know what, like there's some really smart young executives out here that come from, and, and don't get it twisted. The idea and the model of management and label, it is very different, right? Like mm-hmm. as it scales, you have to sort of think about what you're spending 
and how you're doing it's a it is actually a very different business right, right? right, right. um but when you get it right you 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 retain more control, mm -hmm. which is best for the artist because you can guide that you can guide the project. Yeah, um, you're a lot of times not in a situation where you're you might have took like a super huge advance or you're like right. you came in super hot because you were like hot and buzzing. But but like who's gonna develop you now? Like right. you know what I'm saying? Like for sure. having a career is a lot cooler than having like one really big check one time. You know what I'm saying? Like, totally. and that, and that's the scary thing with a lot of these like Spotify hits and TikTok hits. And like, mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing artists get there, you know, that the success isn't, isn't like having that little moment right. and then like getting every label on your dick and then you, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. do some big, that's not really the success point. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the beginning of it. <clears throat> that's the beginning. That's yeah. The beginning. Especially if you truly want to have a career, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. And that comes from a, a, the guidance of the team, you know, the, right. you know, and, and the management team and the artists being really in sync. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, when to dive deeper into the the joint venture side of things too. I mean, I feel like typically the incentive structure for labels versus management. I mean, managers are trying to be the composers of all these disparate different partners. You have the agents that are only worried about getting these artists booked. You have labels that are really only making their money off getting royalties off the actual like streaming and the, the master rights of the music. So the, the management is trying to like have the labels make sure their marketers are helping focus on the longevity of this artist's career rather than just promoting an individual record. So by having the the hybrid, in my perspective, it does a much better job at actually aligning those incentives. Yeah. Um, in your experience, I mean, do you feel that the joint venture, I mean, I'm also curious too, I'll take a step back. I mean, where do you feel the value is in signing and working with major labels today for artists? Obviously it's changed. <coughs> What's yeah. the thing? Where does it make sense? Where does it not make sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's not black and white for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if an artist is signing up and truly wants to be a global star and knows what that means to like really take their career to the next level and break, like mm -hmm. truly break. Yeah. I, I would say that where you need, there, there might be another way to do it, but like 98% right. chance that like the best way to do it is with a major label, mm -hmm. right? And the right team in that major, in that system. Right. Um, if you are looking to maybe have this career where you like put out a few great projects, you create a cult following, um, mm -hmm. and you tour a bunch and you have just no, you just don't care about being on the radio. You actually might be better off going to a distributor with some cash and figuring out a system with your team to make that work. You right. know? Um, and there are a few acts that like aren't signed to majors properly that have done pretty well. Like, you know, obviously chance is the biggest example, but you know, there's Daniel Caesar and, um, Georgia Smith, although I think she distributes still through Sony. So there's still mm -hmm. like major label right. infrastructure behind her, but mm -hmm. she got pretty far with her and her team and a distributor. Mm -hmm. um, but even I'm sure the place that like someone like her is at where it's like, okay, like I'm killing it. I've had like this amazing career, but there's definitely an itch to be like, I could, I could probably, I'm right at that place right. where the next thing could be what puts me mm -hmm. in the superstar category, mm -hmm. right? Like with the right yeah, records. Yeah. Um, and that's going to take global infrastructure, you right. know, breaking an artist in, um, every continent in multiple countries, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. whether it's infrastructure from, you know, people like Universal and Sony and Warner, um, it makes a difference, you know? Like, I was just in Africa over the break. It was a dope trip, and I was in Lagos, and I got to spend time. Um, shout out Eze, who runs Universal Music Nigeria. He was out there with me, and seeing, like, their perspective of what works and what doesn't, mm -hmm. the foreign the foreign catalog, foreign is our music coming in right, right. versus what goes out. And obviously mm -hmm. Afrobeats is having a great crossover moment yeah. and like what that all means. And they're like really on the ground trying to break stuff, you know, right. or like the baby and Megan Thee Stallion came out to Lagos mm -hmm. and um, seeing what they got to do to set up the baby because he goes through Interscope, right? So that goes through Universal. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, when you think about... Uh, <laughs> Is that JFA popping in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Y'all artists just come hang out and just yeah. come out of studios. That's all love. Um, but um, yeah, so like you see what it means to take an artist from zero to 60 yeah. and then from 60 to 100. It is a mm -hmm. different, it's a different process. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's fun. What do you, go ahead, Jordan. I was going to say, I also think that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that 
you know, all the things that you said can just be different parts of an artist's career. So at some point, maybe being on a distribution deal makes sense for that moment. At some mm-hmm. point, maybe, at, you know, leveling up to a major label deal makes sense for that moment. I don't think necessarily doing making a decision to be on an indie for an album or two or being on a distributor for an album or two and then going to a major label thing i don't think they're all like mutually exclusive you Uh know yeah no for sure it's never going to be the same thing and i I think for some artists it's going to take the right um sort of cultural ecosystem right Mm -hmm. like you know you you look at guys like tde you know, shout out love renaissance with their building within atlanta and that vibe and how that's able to work like Mm -hmm. like that like would Summer Walker on a distributor first and then she almost had to be in that system early on, right? Like, Mm -hmm. that was the world and the ecosystem that made it work. Whatever the deal looks like is whatever the deal looks like, but it worked, you know? And that's ultimately what matters, you know what I mean? So, and they've been able to cultivate it and grow it the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the success, you know? Um, And... And that's something to think about too, right? Or like even like, you know, the Dreamville guys killing it um, and how those artists live in that infrastructure that Cole's created, you know, and mm-hmm. what that means for how they're able to break, right? Right. Or like, and the, it's necessary, you know, mm-hmm. for what, when you're talking about what they're, what they're sort of, what they sort of mean as artists, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that too, right? There's like these cultural incubators yeah. that almost have nothing to do with like, what your distribution split is, right, or like, right. you know what I mean? For like, sure. that's just your path for that artist to success, right? right? right. Totally. And there's obviously a ton of artists that build it on their own, like right. you know, like a like a chance, or even in, in major label systems, right? Like, um, and that's dope too. And that's that that takes a little bit more legwork, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, you're going out there and really creating your own audience from scratch, yeah. right? And I think it's way more possible now than it was when like Drake was coming up. And Cole mm-hmm. was coming up, and mm-hmm. it's, they, they like they needed the Jay Z cosign to like right. really get a stamp and be able to amplify fast because totally. it just wasn't the same connectivity between you and your fans in that right. same way, right? It wasn't 100%. as deep. Um, Drake needed Wayne and Cash mm-hmm. Money, you know. Right. Um, so it's more possible now to do it without that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that path to that is that as a manager, you're nav- you're helping navigate that. You know what I'm right. saying? You're helping navigate whatever the path is to success. Yeah, yeah, you for know? Sure, for yeah. sure. How do you um how do you think the A and R process is different from a manager perspective versus a label perspective? Or if it's different at all, you know? <clears throat> I mean, I think there's um there's managers that are that are really good A and Rs, right? Mm-hmm. There's managers that got into it because they can they can get in, they they can pick dope artists early. Mm-hmm. They really get it. They got a great ear. And there's managers that are just like real business guys and like right. and like our hustlers and like know how to put all the pieces around a, a business mm-hmm. and they've like transferred that to an artist because they love music but they mm-hmm. necessarily part i don't know if they should be picking like the single or anything yeah, right, right yeah, yeah. you know and i think we know who those managers are <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, again no shade but we know who those managers yeah, yeah, are yeah, yeah, yeah. um and it's like again it's about the team right like like if you're if it, okay, cool. So if that if that manager has that type of pedigree and they're really good at that, that's a huge asset. Mm-hmm. And usually, I, just trending in my, I'm thinking about like people that I know personally. Like those guys benefit a ton from maybe finding the right A and R at the right major label, and they trust the A and R to do all. Like the A and R and the artists are like this because mm-hmm. they're like, man, y'all know how to make this <laughs> right. stuff sound good. Like I love it, it's cool, but like I'm just gonna blow it up, and you guys mm-hmm. go make the record, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and there's sure. other way around where you see the manager is like super close to the process, right. you know, has a relationship with the producers and all the different managers and and all the different artists themselves even, right? And, mm-hmm. like, helps lock in the feature and has great ideas for, like, yeah. where things should go. And, like, and then they and then they need a team to be super admin-oriented mm-hmm. right. and, like, really run the business. And they'll bring on whatever that is, whether that's mm-hmm. partnering with a management company, right, as a, as a with a partnership, right. or it might be, like, you know, hiring someone to do that, right? Totally, totally, totally. Um, but it's again, it's about those pieces. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like those pieces need to be there. I think the artist has to subscribe to being open minded and listening to those pieces, right? Because right. some artists are like, "Nah, I, I know what I'm making. Like, stay out of the studio." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And like, and then they just come play the record. It's done. Totally. And sometimes it can be amazing. Maybe it's missing a couple things, but like they think it's done. And now it's up to the label and the managers to get it out to the world, right? Mm-hmm. And, then, and there's there's times that that works too, like right. you know. Um, but that's not what every artist needs, you totally. know. And then and and it, it really takes being able to assess that artist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and know what it is. And I think a lot of that, so, again, that's sort of like the special sauce. Like, you mm-hmm. know, like that's what you're paying for, that perspective. Right. And that's what an artist has to sort of realize is that when right when an artist starts to look at their manager or their management team as right. like solely admin people, right? Mm-hmm. And they're just kind of like 
I got it. I know yeah, what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I got the vision. I already got this buzz online. Like you guys are like in line and doing doing your thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like you actually you're actually that's not what you're paying for. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, you're right. not paying for that. Like if you have someone that understands where you need to go and right. has the relationships and the resources, for and sure. then there's people to also do the admin stuff too. Totally. Like your your value add is is way bigger. Yeah, yeah. And I think artists has to they have to really subscribe to that. Like yo, I don't know everything. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, you know. I want to press into that too because obviously one of the most critical, I mean, man, like the most critical component of running a management company successfully and having longevity in doing so is how you maintain and nurture that relationship with the artist. So you were just speaking to the fact of the sometimes you you don't want them to necessarily only see them as an admin function, but you obviously do want to rely a lot upon their vision. Yeah. Can you just talk in your experience what you've learned when it literally just boils down to like dealing with artists, nurturing that relationship, not letting things go sour, keeping them excited? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's relationship business like a lot mm-hmm. of other industries, even more so in music. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a skill set, you know? Right. And there's some managers who have mastered that skill set and mm-hmm. can put a lot of other pieces around to do everything else, mm-hmm. you know? Because it's an important one, right? right. Like your ultimately... Um, your relationship with the artist and your ability to have them trust and believe in what you're trying to do and trust and believe in their vision and figure mm-hmm. out how to meet in the middle and then sort of like through conditioning and repetition and right. that and the relationship being now two years, three years, four years, right. you know, kind of like, all right, I know what you're trying to do. I get what you're, you know, and that, totally. even even that working groove, right? And like like yeah. anything else is super important, right? For sure. And like, that's not, um, not something to be taken lightly, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I think a good example is that is when you see artist get to a certain place and then there's a riff kind of in the team and they might go like oh i need like new management or like you know and they go looking and they might have the biggest meetings in the world but right. like if that groove isn't there like a few big looks yeah. is not the, is not going to replace yeah, yeah. knowing what to do the chemistry and that chemistry yeah. and like and like knowing like the right records and the right timing and really mm-hmm. knowing the fan base and the audience because you built it from right. scratch for you sure, know for sure, and for like sure. that and, and but then you see on the flip side you see the examples of the teams that thugged it out, mm-hmm. like how Drake still has like Oliver and Future still there. Yeah. The guys that were in there from Toronto from day one. Mm-hmm. You know, Cole still has Eve. You know, shout out Eve, guy that been there from day one, right? Yeah. And, you, and even at scale, you see some of the day one guys there and that right. piece is so important because they just know the whole business in and out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're really building uh, a, if you do it right and you scale it and it turns into, into a global app, like you're building a massive business, you totally. know what I mean? Totally. And you really understand what the audience cares about you know, what, what they need, what the artist needs, the temperature of things, obviously, like, the culture around the artist, mm-hmm. meaning, like, the people that are even around them and interact with them change from right. phase one to, like, phase two to, like, oh, shit, I'm, like, in arenas. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, imagine, yeah. like, even the type of people that are floating around, the business, the energy, yeah. right? Right, right, right. <clears throat> so I think keeping... Um, some of those day one people around help center that mm-hmm. energy and that you're ultimately selling energy. <laughs> you right, know what I'm saying? Like sure, an sure. artist has to be in that headspace and, totally. you know, uh, can build it. And that's, it's, I think it's an important part of the recipe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what are some things that you've learned since, since transforming, not just from a manager, but to a label executive also? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, definitely a crazy transition. Um, if, you know, and I think a lot of my, my peers will probably agree that like, we came up having we we came up having to be Swiss Army knives like we had to do everything right yeah. especially in the like pre streaming era where like the Dat Piff era where the label deals sucked mm-hmm. and everyone right. was getting like you know what I mean like compared yeah. to what the deals sound like now yeah. right it's just night and day so you kind of were like for for that for that for that deal I just keep doing it myself right? right and then you created all these like independent hustlers um, but the transition of like sort of trying to do everything and making it work versus like doing it at scale on multiple artists and having a team and having like, you know, a vision for how Mm -hmm. everyone's going to conversate and run and get around the project. So there's definitely a learning curve around that. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been great though, you know, being able to like, like just see what it takes to get a record out the right way. You know what I mean? Um, All of the different nuances and how you want to like talk to your audience, the marketing, the time that it takes to get the marketing right getting the artist to get, get the right records, knowing when you're in a moment and you mm-hmm. need to like kind of step it up and put even a kind of go for a bigger record. You right. know what I mean? Right, um, right. And the process of signing acts too, you know, like yeah. there's acts that we've signed that are just signed to our label that we don't manage. Mm-hmm. There's acts that we've created sort of a partnership deal where we're doing both. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and what that means, right? Like that interaction of working with the artist's manager to, to ultimately get to that same place, right. you know? For sure. Um, and the idea that like you are ultimately trying to sell records, right? Like, mm-hmm. and you do want to like push the artist and push the team to like figure out what the next step is for the artist, you know? Mm-hmm. And and having them really sign up for that, like knowing like what you signed up for, you know right. what I'm saying? Like when you, when you got into a situation, you said, I want this to be a business. Like I want to be a commercially successful artist. Mm-hmm. I want to be as big as I can be. Like you got to own that and you got to know what you signed right. up for versus right. like, you know, putting something out through STEM. Where it's just like, this is just for fun. This is just creative here, totally. you know? Totally. And we deal with a lot of super creative artists. So that's been a, a challenge, but also like a fun challenge. And like, yeah. it's only made me better, you know, to yeah, yeah, yeah. to have to deal with um, wanting the most creative art out of them. You know what right. I mean? But also wanting to see like, what is, that's amazing. And like, how do you see that growing you, right? And right. if it, and if, and if it's going to take time to do it, we're, we're signing up for that. Mm-hmm. Like we love building foundational catalog artists. Right. But like, the deal has to look like that too, right? right. Like, how do you create a business around that totally. that supports that, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think have been, looking back through your journey, some of the hardest things you've had to push through or some of the biggest mistakes that, uh, I mean, in retrospect, may have been some of the biggest, like, lessons or yeah. learnings? Yeah, damn. That's a good one. It's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Hmm. I lost a lot of money on shows, but I guess back in my promoter days, mm-hmm. <clears throat> maybe like taking bets, like the, I guess the ability, like on what risks and what bets to take, you know what right. I mean? And like, uh, I think uh, being a promoter creates tough skin because mm-hmm. you're like either going to crush it that night and like the margin's not that crazy anyway, even if it sells yeah. out and you crush it, but, um, or you're going to tank, <laughs> you know what right. I mean? You might, yeah, you got your guarantee out there yeah. and you're betting on this like new act and like, there's 200 kids in the room, you know what right, I'm saying? Like, right. you know, so I think that creates tough skin mm-hmm. to like find out what people care about and what they don't care about. Totally. I think a lot of like, even my ear comes from that, you know, mm-hmm. seeing like the, 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 you know, even like we picked up JPEG two years ago and seeing how his, tour, his touring hit a big curve. And when I first heard JPEG, it was like, all right, this is like different as fuck. Like, like what is, right. you know what I mean? Like wrapping your head around it, yeah. but like hearing the things in it that I think we're going to make it unique enough to make, people care about it and then seeing what it turned into. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I think a lot of that comes from from those losses. Yeah. You know, from yeah, knowing yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Like, For sure. like this is this is hype versus this is like so there's something real in here. Right. Totally. Um the hiring process, that's been cool to learn as a mm-hmm. as a business owner, not mm-hmm. even a music industry guy. You yeah. know, like what you're looking for in people and what you really need out of people mm-hmm. and vice versa, what they need from you. Right. Um that's been a a, a lesson for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's exciting. That's fun. Sure, uh, made it sound a lot more pleasurable than I bet it was. Oh yeah, in, in the moment. You're yeah. Like, God damn it, man. Every, <laughs> hey, man. It's all a part of the journey. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's hard for me to get upset now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've seen yeah. a lot of shit. So. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Now, one thing too, in my experience, now running Knox for the past year and a half, like my propensity and ability to what how I reacted to things a year, year and a half ago, if something wasn't copacetic or exactly the way I wanted to be, that would like fuck with my mental. Whereas today, year and a half, like you just got to stay chill through it all because inevitably you're just going to continue to have these ups and downs. You're, You're able to think smarter, move better. If you just have this calm mind state. Yeah. And you can see that a lot. I think also in Dan, (laughs) like when, like when bad things happen, Dan will just be like, all right, well, now that that's happened, it's like, <laughs> this is the, this he, like, the next never thing that we should do. Voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, learned, yeah, yeah, for it's sure. Like, it's like his, his calm is like on a whole nother level. Yeah, you know what I mean? definitely. Um, as a manager, and I guess also as somebody at a label, how do you navigate the relationship that you have with the artist? I mean, there are obviously some managers that are really close, you know, best friends with yeah. artists. And this mm-hmm. is a conversation I also had with Dan, like when I first started AQT. Right. It's like, how do you know when to draw that line of, being a manager, being a homie, you know yep. what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and how do you navigate that? Yeah, for sure. That's a good question. Um, and it's tough because, I mean, the relationship does start to really feel like family. And it is yeah. family, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're close to these guys. I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm in years on a, on a few of the clients, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's dope. A lot and, of them. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them, yeah. And it's amazing. Um, but I guess it's a two-way street, right? Like, the artist has to know that too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, I can't just draw that line. They have to also know, like, okay, cool, we're business partners. Like, right. we're in business together. You know what I mean? And, like, 
we have to check each other. We have to be transparent about stuff. We have to be, you know, ethical about things. And, you know, like you might say some, you know, people say shit like that's whatever, but like, um, you have to treat everyone with the same respect. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Cause once the line gets blurred, you can just be goofing around on some homie shit all day. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah. like, we got to get some business done too, totally. you know? Totally. So, um, it's, uh, you know, I think, I think it's a part of the, the skill that separates the, is one of the things that can separate like the greats from the good guys, right? right. Like the ones that can like, it's a personality thing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like a lot of managers can get really far almost based off personality. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And just know, and they, and they understand that part so well mm -hmm. that then they can just put other things around it to like fill whatever holes they don't have, but they're right. great at the personality piece. Right. Totally. Yeah. How much of it being a, a great manager do you think is, you know, personality and being, you know, whether or not extroverted, introverted, that mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, just building a skill set around business? Mm, that's a good question, too. Um, I mean, I can't say it, you know, it's maybe 50 50, you know, but um, it's hard. I think I think every artist is different. I think some artists love the personality part about it like they just want to know like anything can be happening on email behind the manager and what their team is doing they just they just got a vibe with their person you mm -hmm. know what I mean it's all it's all about the creativity and the vibe right? It's, right and then there's then there's people that there's artists that are like you know writing out their own marketing plans and emailing it to you and saying this is what I want <laughs> yeah, to happen yeah, right yeah, yeah. they're probably a little less concerned with your personality and more, <laughs> yeah. and more with like with like how you perform and what you make happen for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that's kind of the answer to that question. Like it depends on the artist, you know. Yeah, and what they need and from you. And what they I need guess. from you, yeah. Yeah. And then and maybe that's a part of being a great manager or a great executive too, is is putting that those personalities around the artist if you have to, right? Like if you need to put certain like people and things, the right people and things around them to get the right answers out, that's almost part of the process, you know. Mm -hmm. I've talked to like friends of mine that are you know, been A&Rs for a minute and it's interesting seeing everyone else's perspective on it, right? Because like, as someone who actually came up as a manager, you're going to hold it up kind of high. Like, man, we're CEOs running a business with the artists. Like we have, we're, we're real business people running stuff. Right. There's certain A&Rs that go, man, the manager just needs to get answers out of the artist for me and we'll do everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right? Like, like sure. the best manager is almost just the person that can get the artist to do things, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're that, if, especially when you got a knucklehead artist, yeah, you know, that, yeah, might, yeah. that might be super talented, but right. just like not showing up to stuff. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, all right, who's going to get this guy to show up? That's yeah. almost <laughs> yeah. like the manager at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that, that's kind of like the a side of the spectrum I try to avoid. You know, that's right. not fun, but sure. that's a part of the game. Totally. Yeah. Um, sorry, you can go, you can go ahead if you want. Okay. I think uh, Crew by Gold Link. Yeah. That Big record. record. Boom. Yeah, yeah, that was a important. Out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk? I mean, how many units were the multi platinum? Platinum. Yeah, they were. I think we're coming up. It's about to hit four million. Yeah, Damn. yeah. Can you talk about the the journey of the uh, of that record? I mean, uh, and yeah. obviously too. I mean, it's not just like the journey leading up to that, building the relationship. Obviously, yeah. all the stars aligned in order yeah. for that to happen. Uh -huh, so can you talk uh -huh. about that that entire all those different stars, <coughs> how they, how yeah, they aligned? For sure. And I mean, I'm sure that also taught you a lot about what you would end up doing, you know, at a label, you know, working your own label. Yeah. And seeing this record grow, taking notes on how this happened. Totally, you know I mean? man. I mean, like that that record actually was like an, an important piece in like getting us prepared to say, okay, cool, maybe we we want to make the next step on yeah. the next few acts we do, right? Like, mm -hmm. um in that in the label capacity but yeah. uh yeah man i mean like being from the dmv and yeah, like you yeah. know and like being able to f know that like that was one of the most important songs to come out of there yeah. like that that's like something i'll you know i'll cherish for forever but um you know i think that's what gave you that extra passion too when it's like time to work a record like that mm -hmm. but um it, just, it was a real slow grower and that was a big part of the story for that record like it came yeah. out at the end of 2016 in mm -hmm. December like the worst time to drop a song like that <laughs> um, and then it crept into the next year 2017 I think it was like February so, or so where we started to feel like this, this is actually a joint we didn't put it out thinking it was going to be like the one yeah, 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 yeah we knew it was dope and and but it was also not particular to his sound and what he mm -hmm. usually does, like mm -hmm. a little bit out of his mm -hmm. box. So me being someone trying to sort of protect the sound and the lane that we're creating, right. I was a little nervous about it. Like, yeah. okay, this is like 
this is just out a little bit out of the, not the one that I thought would be the breakout, right? Right. It was it was a record I fought to make, you know, like mm-hmm. we, I'm good friends with Brent's manager, and we got them in early to make that song, maybe like seven months before it came out, and we got Shy Glizzy on the verse, you know, it was cool. I love mm-hmm. the song, but I didn't think it was like the thing to, yeah, tell, yeah, to keep yeah. telling the story. Right. Um. But yeah, it just kept bubbling. Shot the video in February. Seeing new fans come to the table, like like didn't know what. Golink was doing prior with Kid mm-hmm. Renata and that vibe, and selection and that vibe. It was just bringing in like new fans. So I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. it's a special record. And they just took a life of its own. I think by that summer, it was just like in every it was club. everywhere, man. Yeah, man. That was that was it one of the first summer. times I was involved in anything that I heard on cars in New York City. And it was funny because my girl, you know, every time this song, every time I heard it come out of a car, I would dance in the middle of the street until I couldn't hear it anymore. And it got to the point where she was annoyed by it. That's how many yeah. cars it was in. Yeah, it was but, it was like it was everywhere we went, you yeah, know? Yeah. Nah, it was. And then you guys uh, interviewed Derek on this podcast, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. We yeah. spoke about this too. Yeah. 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 So this Derek, was the, when we interviewed him, it, was, it wasn't that far after it, actually. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was dope. I mean, yeah, even, even just being in the trenches with Derek and Tunji and everybody, like, who should be on the remix. Like, we, it was almost Young Thug for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we, we got Gucci to do it fast, and Gucci cut it. And what that of course did, he did it fast. Yeah. <laughs> Gucci man and gold, and yeah. we got gold since. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember hearing that verse and being like, oh, shit, all right, cool. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, it was funny, because because and, and Gucci means a lot to DC. Mm-hmm. So, like, there was an era when I was, like, coming up in college where, like, and this is, like, mixtape Gucci. Yeah. Like, Gucci would go, would get, you know, get 100 bands or 80 bands to come to DC yeah. at a big ass club right. and there would be go-go bands opening for Gucci so it would mm. be like all this, the 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 crowd that's into go-go in DC mm. was also into Gucci and they would kind of merge it so he had this like real deep root root with DC that's so that's, cool. that's why we kind of were like nah I think we go with Gucci over Thug you know because yeah, yeah, yeah. it would just continue to add to the story right. culturally um, and it worked you know yeah, like, yeah. like in Atlanta and in DC radio it like pushed the record into a place that kind of left like Oh, you had to be cool to know it. Right. Like even college cool and like everyone started to know it. Right, right, right. right. <clears throat> I think that process too showed me just how the, the kind of disparity between the different crowds. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's stuff that like us as like real music fans discover early and we're like super into. Right. So a bunch of people that don't know what any of that stuff is. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, for sure. Then there's records that go kind of just outside of that. Then there's like big cultural records, like streaming hits, mm-hmm. but it's not like your mom knows the hook. You know what I mean? Right. Then totally. there's like that song went number one on Urban Radio for two weeks in a row. So yeah. it started to really become a thing that, like, just everyone could hum that hook. Totally, you know what I mean? Totally. Like, and that's a big... And there's just, like, there's levels to the, to a record really breaking. For sure, you know? for sure. Um, and the story you tell around the record. You yeah, know? that's awesome. So then I want to dive and help things get a little more tactical for some of our listeners, too. When it comes to, like, building a fan base and promoting an artist and their music and all that stuff, how do you think about that and approach that and really help... Uh, guide your artist on the path of quickly and I mean and, uh, building a fan base yeah so then sure. it can't be quick so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I took that back yeah, 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 yeah for sure um, it's funny because then when the moment sort of happens like when it really clicks like you're building a foundation for a minute and then something really clicks yeah. sometimes that can be super quick right like we saw what happened with the baby this year yeah. you know I mean Ooh. that was a little more of like a lightning in a bottle but he was yeah. actually building something prior to that if you go back and look oh for he sure had, he had maybe whole, Jesus bro yeah he had a whole he had a whole story before that yeah 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 um, but you know it's it's every artist's makeup is different I think you got to know what the audience is and who you're touching. Like, for example, Masego, who haven't touched a lot on him, has an amazing fan base, especially internationally. Mm-hmm. And um, Tadao really broke on YouTube. Right. So I think we're at like 160 million yeah, views crazy. or something Sound crazy. Like that. Yeah. Honestly, one of the best songs I've ever heard. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's our first Somebody gold single. Somebody's trying to show that to that's me. That's a label, yeah. That's our wow. first gold single. That's awesome. yeah. But um, no, nah, but like that really that really broke internationally yeah, and it yeah. shows on his ticket sales. So like, yeah. you know, he did um, a few thousand in Asia. You know, I remember putting his Amsterdam show up and blew out and we had to add another one. So we ended mm. up doing like 3,000 in Amsterdam okay. with the album yeah. like only out for a couple months. That's you know what I mean? So like, you got to find those, you got to know, okay, that's, there's a certain audience that's like, you know, hyper engaged and mm-hmm. like really bought in and it's it sort of lives with the FKJ, Tom Mish sort of 
there's that kind of like musicality, almost right. like I call it like the YouTube music nerd sort of like yeah, fan yeah. base that's yeah. like super engaged, the right? Sequencer here, and the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they love me. Like, right, yeah. single is probably one in their top five yeah, for sure. Um, so cool. We have a lot of those people. How do we continue to double down with those people with some live videos? And mm. the genius thing that he did was one of the top ones that Genius put out. The yeah, Genius cool. uh, instrumental thing, right? A bunch of stuff in that vein, right? This colors did really well because mm. that that kind of caters to that audience too a bit. Yeah. Right. But Masego is also a star that's like we talk about it a lot, like super funny. Yeah. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Sure. He has the elements of a of a pop star, like yeah. an R and B pop star, yeah, you know what sure. I mean? So like that's sort of the next stage of his career is mm-hmm. like cool. We checked so many boxes in the sort of like musical underground space. Right. But with the right records and the right moments, he's totally like someone that could cross over to like an urban AC crowd yeah, or totally. even a mainstream urban crowd. Totally, totally. Right. With the right record. So mm-hmm. um following that process, having that vision and knowing like how to get there and doing right. research on that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's amazing. It's fun. Yeah. Dope, dope. Um, I remember when I met Masego, I was it was right before we went to Coachella before Goldlink was playing. Uh-huh. And he walked into the room and sat down and y'all were talking about management. I had no idea that that was even going to happen when I was in the room. I was like, oh, wait, really? we about to manage Masego? Yeah, like while I was in the room. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because he he did the he did the at what cost tour, but we weren't we weren't managing him yet. I think we just started. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Day I met Justin too. Okay, yeah, yeah. We just started around then. Yeah. What do you think helps build longevity for artists? Like, I- even yeah. if you're at the beginning of your career, what are some things that you should be paying attention to? Um, whether you're an artist or a manager looking after an artist, in order to really you know focus on the vision of the career as opposed to just you know putting that song out like you were saying or yeah. getting a big check. Right. For sure. <clears throat> I mean, it starts with the product and the artist, right? The music mm-hmm. and what they're really selling, you know? And then once that's connecting, like, you're kind of like, the first phase is sort of happening organically. Mm-hmm. Then you're trying to follow that trend, right? right. You're trying to build on that. You can't, like, make that happen yeah, from yeah, nowhere, totally. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So once you once you get that first kind of layer, you know, layer of foundation, I think it's, it's giving the fans, understanding the fan base, understanding your audience, mm-hmm. right? Touring is, everyone's going to say touring is, like, number one right, right. once the, if the music is great and the artist is great and the momentum is there touring is going to be the first thing to mm-hmm. really create a one-on-one relationship with a bunch of a bunch of your fans um having a great live show too i think there's a lot of artists and we and it's, it's totally cool but we see artists that come from the bedroom pop scene or are popping off of spotify quickly and it's like yo you got a song and an ep that's moving you gotta get on the road and yeah like, uh i haven't really played shows before you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. and we all seen an artist especially in this last four years or so seen an artist's first show that you were like stoked on the music like man mm-hmm. he's fire like i'm i can't wait to see this show right. and you get there and it's like mm, okay this, that was kind of mediocre <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know? it's awkward now <laughs> yeah but, i love this music and right that performance wasn't that wasn't that good. underwhelming yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> And but now it's up to the management team and the artists being open minded that you got to rehearse before right. you know you can't totally. just think like I'm just gonna wing this you know yeah, yeah. um and, and then a part of it's just like experience you know right. seeing and honestly I, I love that part of of seeing you know I was there for some, literally some of Spino's first shows around Black Jupiter wow. and now he's like an incredible live performer you know what I mean <laughs> like people come up to me and go like yo he's so dope the full right. band the energy yeah. you know Masego the him and Masego went on. Back to back Afropunk on the same stage. Damn. This in Atlanta, amazing sets back to back. Both awesome. have full bands, great character on yeah, stage, yeah, yeah. and it's like night and day from some of the first sets I've seen from mm-hmm. them. You know, that's, that's real development. Yeah. Now you know when they catch a record or catch that big moment with an album, mm-hmm. like, and they get into a bigger room or they get into an arena, they're ready. Right, you know, right. and that system or that idea isn't always. With, with artists popping off so quickly now, you're not mm-hmm. going to always get that, you know? Right, right, uh, right. Like, I, I saw Billie Eilish perform, and she was amazing live, and I was so... I looked at, you know, Dan and the guys that managed her that they really de- helped her develop that, but that easily could have been something that, like, you know, she went from 500 cap rooms to arenas in 18 months, right? right. Something yeah, like yeah. that. So if it wasn't prepared and developed and rehearsed or they kind of winged it even a little bit, yeah. you'd be on a huge stage and it just wouldn't be it. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, for and sure. like, you know, there's people like Billy and Khalid that have grown so fast and luckily they have good teams around them, but like they have to develop faster in front of everybody, totally. you know? Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, so it's seen both sides of it. Seen, seen the stuff that like is pretty big and sells a lot of tickets. It's just not that great right, you know right, right, right. um versus like the stuff that's been developed 
for a long time. And when they get to arenas, the show's like, mm -hmm. you know, pristine and yeah, yeah, yeah. just natural and like so good, for you sure, know? For sure. Um, I think it also develops a story too with the fans, you know, like fans want to see you grow and change. And mm -hmm. like, they remember your different hairstyles from different album cycles. Yeah. And, you know, they, they different merch along the way that they would still own. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, like yeah. that whole process is really big um, to creating a story. You right. Know? For sure. Mm -hmm. That's exciting, man. I guess one last question on my end is uh, when you see the future, how do you see management companies and management companies that are hybrids with labels? How do you see the, the landscape changing in the future? What does the management company of the future look like as far as how it really serves its artists? <clears throat> yeah, that's a, let me see. Let me, let me get my Steve Jobs on. And yeah. see what I, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't really have like a, it's tough. I, I, well, you know, I, I think the ventures that are happening now, you know, shout out Le Renaissance since the eighties, you mm -hmm. know, keep cool. These different companies that are, are on the ground floor and are, and are figuring out how to make those hybrid deals work. Right. I, I think that's the next right. iteration of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's just managers partnering with artists. If that's a better way to do it for the artists, you know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? Like partnering like officially, maybe like they're doing some kind of funding and helping develop it. But it's right. really like the it's more artist led. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah, that yeah. could be interesting. Um, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, it's it just it just changes so much that it's right. hard to for say sure, for sure. Like that, it's gonna something's gonna work or not work. Totally. You know, I'd be lying if I was like, man, I know what it's gonna look like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, for sure, for sure, for yeah. Sure. So I don't know. But from what I've seen so far, I just think companies will get their hands in more things. So, like, companies will start as management companies, and then they kind of become this hybrid of labels and, and management companies, and then they get into different sides of publishing, or they have a branding department. And I just, I just kind of see all of these things coming together to make, like, one just powerhouse of a company. Kind of yeah. like what Red Light was saying yeah, la last night. Fully yeah. vertically integrated. Own yeah, e production. E exactly. Own exactly. Yeah. They yeah. just they just start making that stuff in-house. You know what I mean? That's right. kind of like what I see the next step being, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. No, it's definitely possible. I, it's been hard to get it to get it to fully work, I think, mm -hmm. for, for a yeah. long time. Yeah. And because people have had these ideas for a minute, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's not new to us. It's it's yeah. happened during the CD boom. There was people trying to do, you know, hype or or even overseas, like in the K-pop scene, and you know, like the '88 Rising guys, and mm -hmm. in Nigeria when I was out there and hearing how they do stuff. It's incredibly common for like your manager to also just be your label and right. your funding partner, and they're just kind of doing it, and mm -hmm. then and they're scaling it with with a lot of that stuff in house, you know, especially in the mm -hmm. K-pop scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not a brand new concept. I think it's just the U.S. is a massive market too, right? Mm -hmm. Like in general, sure. so try to trying to do it at scale and do mm -hmm. it good, well, yeah, you know, yeah, and, and yeah. consistently has yeah. always been an issue, but there might be more room for it now than there ever was. Totally. So hopefully someone can really figure it out. Yeah, yeah. 100%, 100%. Yeah. Right. Cool, man. Well, Henny, I'm going to keep, uh, I'm excited to see you personally yeah. continue to grow. Obviously, all the artists too. I uh, already got them on repeat. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be listening. So uh, thank yeah. you so much for coming on the podcast. Man. Yeah, really man. Thank you, man. Thank you guys for coming by. Come down to the studio. Come yeah, to hang. In the EQT studio. Yeah. It's probably surreal for Jordan. I, I get to come on here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, he knows everything. So we got a little inside information. But <laughs> yeah. Right. Sure, right. Man. I appreciate y'all. It's fun. All right. Yeah, for well, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Man. All right. We up. Man, super glad we got him on, dude. Super glad we got him on. It's always an honor to get people I'm close to like that on the podcast, especially because a lot of the reason why I know the things that I do was, you know, under his mentorship and under Dan Freeman's mentorship and guidance, you know. So um, I thought it was super dope that he came on. Obviously, Henny and I have had a lot of discussions about his career, but not necessarily in depth like that. And you can very much tell how logical he is with his thinking mm -hmm. and how he wants to build not just a team, but he wants to be, you know, as he put it, one of these incubators of culture where people can yeah. really grow into the artists that they need to be to succeed all within the EQT ecosystem. For you know? sure, for sure. And I, I mean, I think EQT, forefront of different sounds and genres that will only pick up more traction. I think the fact that they're in this unique place, having had the success in the management front, affording them the opportunity to do a joint venture with a major label like Universal. Um, I think I'm also very interested to see just how the manage, I mean, management as a business continues to evolve and kind of redefine what the role of a manager is. And I, I definitely think EQT is really pushing forward and is at the forefront of that. So very excited to see EQT continue to grow. Uh, very grateful 
as always, that you guys are tuned in and listening. So, uh, you know the drill. We'll be back next week. Another week, another podcast. Like, comment, and subscribe. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Shout out to you guys, man. For sure. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you.